not angry with me, are you? No, I'm not angry. I don't think I'm anything, really. I just feel tired. Forgive me? Forgive you for what? For everything. For meeting you in the first place. For taking the piece of grit out of your eye. For loving you. In 1945, Noel Coward and David Lean made a film which would become one of the true classics of post-war cinema and one of the greatest screen romances, Brief Encounter. I suppose of all Noel Coward's films, it is Brief Encounter that you always come back to first. It is the only perhaps true classic film which has his name on it. No, Alec, not here. Someone will see. I love you so. Of all the films I made, this is the one that people remember the most. What a nerve talking to you like that, Mrs. Baggett. Be quiet, Beryl. Pour me out a nip of three star. I'm feeling quite upset. It's a very English picture. And the main characters are wanting to be good, to be nice, and not to hurt other people. A moving tale of a chance meeting that becomes a love affair Brief Encounter would be Noel Coward and David Lean's fourth and final collaboration. Lean had been a highly respected film editor when Coward gave him his big break as co-director of the 1942 naval drama In Which We Serve. Abandon ship! In return, Lean brought to the screen two of Coward's plays, This Happy Breed and Blithe Spirit. Brief Encounter also owed its origins to the stage. Of course, it had a very curious start. It was written as uh, not a film at all, but one of nine short plays, uh, thrillers, comedies, musicals, and love stories, in a sequence called Tonight at 8.30. It was originally called Still Life. It was set famously on Milford Railway Station, and it's the story of a married couple who happened to be married to other people. Better? I'm afraid not. Oh. Can I help you? Uh, oh, no, please, it's only something in my eye. Try pulling your eyelid down as far as it'll go. And then blowing your nose. Please let me look, I happen to be a doctor. But while Still Life was a play set entirely in a railway cafe, Coward, with the help of David Lean, Ronald Neem and Anthony Havelock Allen, transformed this intimate drama into pure cinema. There. Oh, what a relief. It was agonising. Looks like a bit of grit. It was when the express went through. Thank you very much indeed. What happened in developing a uh, brief encounter from a half-hour play, it became what it only sketched in itself and never had the time to become in the playlet itself. It was just a series of incidents in a railway waiting room. Good morning. Oh, good morning. How's the eye? Perfectly all right. How kind it was of you to take so much trouble. It was nothing at all. But somehow when you saw a, the small country town in which it happened, the whole thing became closer to reality, closer to a real situation between two honourable people. And it became a struggle between two honourable people to remain honourable people and not to do something that, from which they both knew nothing but more unhappiness could come. Laura, you're looking frightfully well. I do wish I'd known you were coming in today. We could have come together and lunch and had a good gossip. I loathe shopping by myself anyway. There's your train. Yes, I know. The play was chronological, but the way that David constructed that completely him was, I think, quite brilliant. We had to find a way of getting the audience immediately. And uh, hence the reason why we shot it out of continuity and how we began the picture almost with the end of the picture. I'm Scar. Yes, you must. Goodbye. Goodbye. And you know that these two, that Trevor Howard and Celia, are obviously in some emotional state and you're immediately interested. Well, he certainly was very good looking. Who? Oh, your friend, Dr. whatever his name was. Yes, he's a nice creature. Have you known him long? No, not very long. I hardly know him at all, really. <laughs> the role of Laura Jessen, a wife and mother who finds herself embarking on an affair, went to Celia Johnson. I wish I could trust you. I wish you were a wise, kind friend. 
instead of a gossiping acquaintance I've known casually for years and never particularly cared for. She had already appeared in two previous Cowardlean collaborations, In Which We Serve and This Happy Breed. By now, Celia Johnson was one of our favourites. Celia Johnson is the only actress that didn't think acting was very important and yet was wonderful. Celia Johnson could move you more than any other actress I know. Celia Johnson could read the yellow pages and make you cry. She, she was wonderful and great. I wish you were dead. No, I don't mean that. That was silly and unkind. But I wish you'd stop talking. She'd been asked by Noel Cowd to do a film of a play called Still Life, which turned into Brief Encounter, and she had a meeting uh, with Noel for him to discuss the script with her. And this is the letter she wrote to my father about the meeting. There is no getting away from the fact that it is a very good part and one I should love to play. It's about a woman married and with two children who meets by chance a man in a railway waiting room and they fall in love and it's all no good. It will be pretty unadulterated Johnson and when I'm not being sad or anguished or renouncing, I'm narrating about it. So if they don't have my beautiful face to look at, they will always have my mellifluous voice to listen to. Lucky people. This can't last. This misery can't last. She has the most fantastically cinematic face. Those incredibly huge, luminous eyes, you know, which uh, the camera just dives right into. And the, the look of, looks of desolation on her face, you know, which are so essential in that film, you know. I remember there was one point when a tear dropped from the corner of her eye. And I thought, oh, how lovely that is. And have they put glycerin in the corner of her eye to make that happen? Oh, no, they hadn't. But when they did a retake, that tear came at exactly the same moment. And of course, it was because she was thinking so deeply about the love affair that she was having. I wondered if he'd say, I met such a nice woman at the Cardoma. We had lunch and went to the pictures. And then suddenly I knew that he wouldn't. I knew beyond a shadow of doubt that he wouldn't say a word. And at that moment, the first awful feeling of danger swept over me. Before Brief Encounter, characters never thought in British films. They simply acted. They did things. Brief Encounter, you actually dwell on those two faces. David Lean gives you time to see them think, to see them decide, can they break their marriage vows? Can they go off together? If so, what kind of life will they lead? Had a good day? Yes, lovely. What'd you do? Well, I shopped and had lunch and went to the pictures. All by yourself? Yes. Uh, no, not exactly. <laughs> what do you mean, not exactly? Well, I went to the pictures by myself, but I had lunch with Mary Norton. She couldn't come to the pictures with me because she had to go and see her in-laws. They lived just outside Milford, you know. So I walked with her to the bus and then came home on my own. And there's a moment when she looks in the mirror uh, with her husband and she has just told a lie. And that, I think, is an extraordinary little scene. It, it, it shows that she, she's doing something completely wrong and she knows it's wrong and she's sort of rather shocked in herself. She, she shows so much emotion with so little. I think that's what I admire about it. I stood there and watched his train draw out of the station. I stared after it until its tail light had vanished into the darkness. Yeah, I think Celia Johnson has been uh, misrepresented. I mean, sometimes people uh, think they remember somebody as sounding a certain way, and in fact, they don't sound like that at all. And you know, everybody goes, "I walked down the street; it was so terrible." She never, she didn't talk like that. I mean, her voice has got, I, I def only the most cold-hearted sort of Ray-Ban-wearing, face magazine-toting, postmodern cynic could possibly not be moved by Celia Johnson. I stared out of that railway carriage window into the dark and watched the dim trees and the telegraph posts slipping by. And through them, I saw Alec and me. Alec and me, perhaps a little younger than we are now, but just as much in love and with nothing in the way. You have a sequence in this film where she's on the train and the romance is clearly underway and she's imagining all the places where she and Alec are going to go to, uh, which could be 
you know, it, it, that teeters on the verge of Mills and Boone. You know, it's saved um, by the tone of her delivery, because there is a dying for to the way she speaks and makes you aware that she's she's not only aware that this is fantasy, she's also aware that this fantasy is leading into dangerous waters. That wonderful bit of dialogue. Then the palm trees changed into those pollarded willows by the canal just before the level crossing. And all the silly dreams disappeared. And I got out of Ketchworth and gave up my ticket and walked home as usual, quite soberly and without wings, without any wings at all. During the filming of Brief Encounter, Noel Coward was abroad entertaining Allied troops. Apart from additional dialogue, Coward had very little to do with the production process, but there was one thing he insisted upon. And then when she goes home, and it's an ordinary family, and she sits down and there is her dull husband, and she puts on the Rachmaninoff deep, which was Noel. Noel said, there is one piece of music for this film, and only one piece of music, and that's the Rachmaninoff. The Rachmaninoff and Brief Encounter are just automatically together now, aren't they? Nobody thinks of, the, of one without the other. And the, that music is the epitome of, of love and sadness and emotion, isn't it? You're a doctor, aren't you? I remember you said so that day in the refreshment Yes, Yes, not a very interesting one, just an ordinary GP. The role of Dr Alec Harvey went to Trevor Howard a young actor who'd been spotted in the Anthony Asquith film The Way to the Stars. Eight years younger than his co-star, and at this point much less experienced, Howard nevertheless proved to be a perfect piece of casting. Today, we would never have been allowed to make Brief Encounter because the people who put up the money would have said, Celia Johnson, my goodness, nobody knows Celia Johnson, and Trevor Howard, who's Trevor Howard anyway? Oh, no, no, we've got to have better names than that we would have been shot down in flames. But we saw Trevor in a very small part, and um, David and, and I both said, Trevor is the one, and, and we, we couldn't do better. So we went to Noel, and we showed Noel this small part, and, he, and Noel said, no question, cast him. You don't play the piano, I hope. I was forced to as a child. You haven't kept it up? No. My husband isn't musical at all. Good for him. Well, for all you know, I might have a tremendous burning professional talent. Oh, dear, no. Why are you so sure? You're too sane and uncomplicated. I suppose it's a good thing to be uncomplicated, but it does sound a little dull. You could never be dull. A lovely man, completely uncomplicated, uh, loved booze, uh, uh, a hearty, heavy drinker, who, and this is an interesting one, Trevor never knew his lines when he came on the set. But after four or five rehearsals, he was word perfect. Are you going to pictures this afternoon? Yes. Hmm. Extraordinary, so am I. But with Trevor, that was what gave him the, 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 the natural approach to his acting, that he didn't know the exact words until he was actually rehearsing the scene. Excellent actor, lovely actor, one of the best I've worked with. Shall I see you again? It's the other platform, isn't it? You'll have to run. Don't bother about me. Mine's not due for a few minutes. Shall I see you again? Yes, of course. Perhaps you'll come out to catch with one Sunday. It's rather far, I know, but we should be delighted. Please, please. What is it? Next Thursday, the same time. Well, I think David Lean was brilliant at finding two people who were sort of sexually and physically and romantically kind of closed in, suddenly finding this kind of love which burst open and kind of bursts them. And in a way, it kills them. In a way, they are destroyed by that love. What happened then, Mrs. Beckett? Well, well, it's all very fine, I said, expecting me to do this, that and the other, but what do I get out of it? I had a wonderful first meeting with David Lean. He just put me at my ease straight away by saying, I'm so glad we're going to be working together. Cheerio, Muller. And if them sandwiches were made this morning, you're Shirley Temple. Thank you, Albert. What's he said, uh, these characters in the refreshment room are very, very important to the film. And it's 
so lovely to have you with us. Well, I couldn't feel anything but at ease when he spoke like that to me. Minnie hasn't touched her milk. Did you put it down for her? Yes, but she never came for it. Fans of Brief Encounter will know that Alec and Laura aren't the only couple in the cafe at Milford Junction. One of Britain's best-loved character actors, Stanley Holloway, played Mr. Godby, the station porter with a soft spot for the ever-so-refined Mrs. Baggett, played by Joyce Carey. Stanley was so very sweet and kind and very funny. He kept us all amused when there was plenty of time to be hanging around between shots and he would give us some of his monologues, which he knew off by heart, would make us laugh. Joyce Carey was, of course, not at all like the haughty lady behind the counter. She was a very sweet lady. Oh, but God be, how dare you? I couldn't resist it. I'll trouble you to keep your hands to yourself. Oh, you're blushing. Oh, you look wonderful when you're angry. Just like an avenging angel. But she does operate completely from a level of, of uh, bogus middle-class mores. I, I, can't, I can't imagine to what you might be referring, all, all that kind of stuff, and primping her hair and everything. And, and she does, she is clearly up for a good bit of slap and tickle. Um, and certainly had been in her day. I don't know to what you're referring. They are like the subplot, you know, in a Shakespearean play, in a way. You can't say we're the comic relief, because I don't think we are that really, are we? But we're certainly a foil against the poignant tale going on. There are just as good fish in the sea, I said, as ever came out of it. And I packed my boxes then and there and left him. Didn't you never go back? The scene where she's telling me about, about her husband, and, and I say to her, didn't you never go back? And she says... What happened to him? Dead as a doornail inside three years. Well, I never. Well, I never. You know, it was a, <laughs> a nice scene, really. Many of the scenes in Brief Encounter, including those in the refreshment room, were shot at Denham Studios. Denham Village became the town of Milford, but for the scenes on the platform, a real station was needed. Carnforth Station in Lancashire provided a perfect location for Alec and Laura's romance. They needed a junction, of course. They wanted two main lines so that there was lots of activity of, of, the, of the trains. So Carnforth was good for that. But also, it was a long way from London. And just before the war ended, it meant that they could break the blackout rules and have the station blazing with lights. This was um, during the filming of, of, in, of Brief Encounter. I'm scared stiff of the film. It's going to be most awfully difficult. You need to be a star of the silent screen, really, because there's such a lot of stuff with commentary over it. It's terribly difficult to do. I do hope to goodness it will be all right. I must go now and do a beastly difficult shot on a frightfully cold platform. I think Brief Encounter has to be seen at least three times before you can appreciate the brilliance of the direction of that picture. When she nearly throws herself under the train and she comes out and you see the a long shot of the train coming vroom, fast like that and then you go to a close shot of Celia and you stay on that close shot all the time you never ever cut to the train perfect acting because in that great big close shot you knew what agony she was going through today brief encounter is regarded as one of the greatest British films ever made but when it was first shown to audiences it met with a very different reception we were shooting Great Expectations in Rochester, in Kent, at the time that Brief Encounter was completed. And we decided we'd have a preview. It's a big picture now. Here we go. No more laughter. Prepare for tears. And we were obviously nervous. And uh, the film started. And about three minutes into the film, there's a rather sentimental, rather moving little bit of film, we thought. And a lady, a woman sitting in the front row, laughed. She went, ah, ha, ha, ha. And of course, when she laughed, four or five other people around her laughed as well. And David and I sort of, you know, thought, oh my goodness, what's happening? It was a terribly bad picture. We crept out before the end, rather furtively, 
as though we were committing a crime. David thought, oh my God, I've got the mood of England wrong and they will never like it. But when it got to London and when it got to the critics, they were still indeed conservative enough to say, yes, this is a film about honor and nobility. And again, it came at that absolute crossover moment when with the end of the war, England was, if you like, losing its morality. Do you think we shall ever see each other again? I don't know. Not for years, anyway. The children will all be grown up. I wonder if they'll ever meet and know each other. Couldn't I write to you just once in a while? No, Alec, please, you know we promised. Brief Encounter is almost the last bastion of good behavior. It's the last film which says, don't give in to your heart, don't give away to your emotions, don't be sentimental, do your duty. Lord, dear, I do love you so very much. I love you with all my heart and soul. I want to die. If only I could die. If you died, you'd forget me. I want to be remembered. Yes, I know I do too. It deals with, very simply with emotions. It's not a sophisticated film in the sense of its plotting. It has a, a simple solar plexus story which it drives home with beautiful simplicity. If ever I see Brief Encounter, I have to say to myself, just before the end, as I sit in the audience, I have to say to myself, now Ronnie, don't be stupid. This is a film. It's all in tins. It's all in that box up there. And it's going on the screen and it's just a film. And you really must not get into a state about it because that's stupid. I tell all this to myself. But in those last few minutes of brief encounter, whenever I see them, there are tears streaming down my face and great embarrassment when the lights go on in the theatre. That last scene where she returns to her husband and she's absolutely broken at having to part from Trevor Howard. And um, he is understanding and sympathetic. He knows that something has happened. He doesn't quite know what. Is there anything I can do to help? Yes, Fred, you always help. You've been a long way away. And he says, well, whatever it was, thank you for coming back to me. And I cry because I think it's such a wonderful piece of film. And I must tell you that that film today is as good as it ever was and will go on being full time. I'm so glad I had a chance to explain. I didn't think I'd see you again. How upset of you. Quickly, quickly. Next Thursday? Yes, next Thursday. Goodbye. Goodbye.